All right, we're gonna start today with the 137th Psalm. Now, I will tell you before I read this Psalm that the last words of the Psalm are a little bit brutal and people uh, uh, take issue with it. If you understand the context, then it would uh, uh, not be such an unhappy uh, image that you get uh, when you hear this Psalm. So please understand there is a context and there is a uh, 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 reason why this is in here, but don't take offense at it. This is the Lord's word and uh, uh, it's just something that is a part of the people of Israel and what has happened to them over the years. And in the end, all scripture is God breathed. And so this is something that God ordained to be in his word. The 137th Psalm, by the river, rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked us of a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Heavenly Father, here we are in your presence and here we are meeting to uh, understand your word better, to understand who you are and what you would have us to know from your word. And uh, so be with us through this service and help us to uh, uh, attempt to grasp the beautiful truths and the beautiful pictures which are given in your word and which are revealed to us. And uh, we thank you for every good blessing that you've given us. You've just, you've abundantly blessed us. You've given us food in the past week and joy in our hearts and uh, family and fellowship. And uh, you've brought us again to this place where we can meet in your presence. We thank you for the weather that you've given us. It looked like a little bit of rain a while ago, and yet now it's uh, clear and it's nice and breezy. And uh, we thank you for that. And uh, we want to thank you, Lord, for our mothers. It's Mother's Day here at Church on the Beach, and uh, we want to thank you for each and every one of them and uh, for the uh, hard work that they have uh, put forth for their families and for their children over the many, many years. And uh, uh, just we want to give you praise and glory and honor for them. And uh, in all things, help us just to remember that you are God and that you are in control of all things. And when our lives seem like they're on a, a, a ship on an ocean of turmoil and trial, that you are there with us. Thank you for that assurance. And we just love you and we praise you in the exalted and in the glorious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Okay, I have nothing to uh, say about the uh, property at Superior Avenue this week. The uh, paperwork was resubmitted on Monday and uh, I checked every day. I probably hit refresh about 500 times a day and um, the county has not done anything with the paperwork. All it says is pending review. So um, we have no uh, new update on that and uh, eventually things will get started, but uh, it may be a while. And um, we have uh, water over here. I say this every week. If anybody has never been scripturally baptized and they wanna do that, I'll do that any day of the week or uh, uh, you know, just at your convenience. And uh, baptism is something that should uh, follow uh, uh, acceptance of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a picture of what you have done. You have died with him. You've been put into the grave with him and you've come out uh, of the grave with him. And the law is crucified. It was nailed to the tree. And therefore, uh, sin no longer has the um, power over us. We are justified once and all forever because of the work of Jesus. And baptism is a picture of that. It's saying, I have received what Jesus Christ did and now I want to make a picture of that in my own life by being buried with him through baptism and raised to newness of life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's just simply an outward confirmation of the inward change that has come. So if you want to do that, I'll be here and uh, uh, happy to uh, baptize you at any time. And um, today is our 73rd Genesis sermon. It's um, something that I've been looking forward to for uh, about five weeks since I typed it. I think it's just, uh, it's the kind of sermon that I enjoy the most and uh, it, it's uh, the pictures that are in there are so wonderful and they're so beautiful that I'm, I'm just so pleased to uh, 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 be able to deliver this today. And as usual, it's gonna be a little complicated if you're uh, not well versed in uh, especially Pauline theology, Paul who wrote 13 epistles of the New Testament, then 
it will be a little complicated, but in the end, I think you will see that uh, God's hand is upon his word. So I'm in, looking forward to this. And um, I will do a New Testament reading uh, today. Uh, last week we did Romans uh, 15, 14 through 21. So let me see what do we wanna do today. We'll start with 22 and just go through the rest of the chapter, Romans 15. And uh, we don't do any real complicated reading here. I just read it and give a couple short uh, thoughts on it. Uh, this isn't really a Bible study. It's more just to keep fresh with the uh, New Testament as we're going through the Old Testament. So uh, Romans 15, verse 22, it says, For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. Uh, Paul was speaking about... Um, uh, what had happened in the past and uh, how he had wanted to not preach where other people had already laid a foundation. Rome was already a church. The foundation was laid. And uh, so he's telling us that for this reason, I've been hindered in coming to you. He's been out establishing new churches all over the place. Um, verse 23, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. So uh, this is a, a testament to the amount of labor that Paul put in because obviously he's gone through all of Asia Minor. He's gone through the regions. He's preached every single town and he said, there's no more work for me to do in these areas. I have laid a foundation. Other people will step in and start uh, running the churches which we've established, but it shows you how much work this man did. It's simply astonishing. Anyway, and he's saying that he wants to now go to Spain and on the way stop in Rome. Um, some people say he made it to Spain. Other commentators say he never did, but he did get to Rome. That's recorded in the book of Acts. He was taken there as a prisoner and uh, eventually uh, tradition, not the Bible says that he was uh, martyred in Rome for his faith. Um, let's see here. He says, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. And if I uh, may enjoy your company for a while. So he's looking forward to a little bit of fellowship and maybe uh, them supporting him on his mission uh, from Rome on his way to Spain where he could do more work. Uh, verse 25, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. And uh, then he explains why he's going to Jerusalem and what in fact he was doing on his way down there. In verse 26, he says, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Well, poor uh, Paul always had the poor on his mind. And when he's speaking of the poor, he's speaking about the uh, believers that were there left behind in Jerusalem. There was this dispersion that was noted during the book of Acts and uh, uh, the saints that stayed there obviously were persecuted. They were probably lost their jobs. Who knows what you know trials they faced for simply bearing the name of Jesus. But it was his intent and goal always to think of these poor people and to uh, help them out. And the Macedonians were more than willing to go down and help them out as well. And um, so uh, he speaks about that elsewhere as well. But he says, um, uh, verse 27, it pleased them indeed, and they are debtors. Okay, he's going to make a point here, which is something that we all need to remember and we should not forget. Um, we are uh, debtors for if the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish people of the world, have been partakers of their spiritual things, okay, their, uh, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. And so the word came from the Jew throughout the, the time from Moses all the way up until the time of Paul. And in fact, Paul as well is a, uh, a Jew. And um, uh, because our heritage came from the Jewish people. It is our obligation as Christians to support the Jewish people. Uh, a lot of people have taken uh, uh, contrast to that over the many centuries since then because they uh, did not accept Jesus Christ as Lord. They were exiled among the nations and a lot of people think, as a matter of fact, it was a policy of the church uh, during the Crusades. They had a saying, kill a Jew, save your soul. So um, obviously that was not uh, what God intended. And um, uh, the idea is that we should be supporting the Jewish people and standing behind them because Paul very clearly explains that they do have a purpose in the future, as does the uh, uh, Old Testament as well. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit today, is that the Old Testament does show that the Jewish people will again be the center of God's attention, and that will happen after the end of the church age. And I do believe that that is coming very soon to a theater near you, so stand by for that. And... Um, uh, so anyway, he's telling them uh, partakers of their, the Jewish spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. And I might as well add in real quickly before we go on that only a couple books in the whole Bible were not written by Jews. One of them in the Old Testament, if in fact it was written by Job, would be one of them. It may have been written by a, a Jewish person uh, chronicling what happened to Job, but if it was 
written by Job, then that was one of them. There's only two others in the Bible. The first one is the book of uh, Luke. Uh, Luke was a Gentile, he was a physician, and the other one is the book of Acts. And uh, people will dispute that. You'll see commentaries that say, no, uh, Luke was a proselyte and he became a Jew. And one, there's no proof of that. And two, the book of Colossians very clearly uh, details that uh, Luke is a Gentile, even at the time of the writing of the book of Colossians. So uh, at least two books and possibly three of the Bible were written by non-Jews. But for the most part, the oracles of God came through the Jewish people. Um, Verse 28, therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed them this fruit, taking the uh, charitable donations down to the saints in Jerusalem, after I've done this, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Um, Verse 29, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Um, you know, people wonder, do prayers really work? God doesn't change, and therefore, uh, uh, if we pray, we're not really changing God's mind on anything. That's not how prayer works. God knew before he created us that we would be here. He knew before he created us that tree would be standing there. He knew before he created anything, all things. He knows everything immediately and intuitively. And when we pray, he knew that we would pray, or if we don't pray, he knew that we would not pray. And therefore, when he uh, uh, responds to our prayers. It's something that he's responding to in his mind before creation. But the fact is that Paul says that uh, people's prayers combined have a greater effect than single prayers. He notes that here. He notes that elsewhere. We are to pray, and we're also to pray in a united way as well. When somebody's sick, you get more people together. God will, in that uh, infinite mind, respond to the prayers of the many. So uh, it's just it's the truth of the Bible. That's what the Bible details. Um, so he says, um, uh, verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who did not believe. So he's asking specifically for prayers of, against the people that, uh, that had rejected Jesus Christ. Because Paul was, uh, if you've followed the book of Acts, he was a persecutor of the church. He called himself a blasphemer. He went out and he uh, uh, did things to persecute the church. And I'll mention this during the sermon as well. And eventually he was called of God. And uh, he was converted, and he will give you his credentials in several books of the Bible, um, specifically who he was, what he did, but he was in the very top echelon of the religious society in Israel. And when he gave that up, they really did not like him. And the book of Acts details it very clearly, what they uh, held against him and what they tried to do in order to get him executed. But he's asking for prayers that that doesn't happen, and uh, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Verse 32 that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And when Paul says amen, it's not ever the end of a sermon. He does this several times where uh, there's a whole other chapter to go. But um, uh, there are times where uh, Paul will say something like, it'll sound like he's concluding, and man, the guy's just getting started. So uh, as you're reading uh, Paul's words, you'll see that. He, he, he keeps the ideas going, and uh, everything he does is very structured and very logical. But uh, that's where we'll stop with our New Testament reading today. We'll read one more real quick psalm, and then we'll get into a couple other things. Um, Psalm 138, this is a psalm of David. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. David knows how to instill in me the the deepest emotions because when you read the words of David, I'm sure many of you feel this way, he is writing right from his soul. And he was a person that was uh, uh, living in a sinful world and he was uh, hemmed in by his own sins from time to time. And if you want to really find comfort in the things you've done in your life or maybe continue to do, David is there and, and his words will provide that. So keep that in mind. Um, a couple people showed up a little bit uh, after we got started. So I want to 
wish all of the mothers here a happy, happy Mother's Day. And uh, my hat is off to you for your achievements and your, uh, uh, your fortitude through raising people like me, especially my mother. And uh, as a uh, symbol of my gratitude to all mothers, I have something for my own mother. So let me go get that. Okay, I need to get, I need to get my mother to come up here. Please come up and accept your uh, bouquet of flowers. And uh, this is for you. Oh, we, somebody wants to take a photo of us, so here we go. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, happy Mother's Day, and here's what it says. It says, happy, happy Mother's Day from, oops, I spelled that wrong, your favorite son. Okay, <laughs> I said you favorite son. Obviously, I'm not a card guy. I never have been a card guy. And uh, as a matter of fact, the only cards I give out are the ones that uh, I take care of a mall, and in that mall is a drugstore. And uh, what they do is when they put in new cards throughout the year, they pull out all of the uh, things that say like Mother's Day and Easter, you know, the little white things behind the cards. And they throw them away and they make great um, notepads. And so I pull those out and then I try to find one for the day. There wasn't a Mother's Day one in there, but that one says something like you're special. But I will tell you a funny joke about those. Uh, seeing as how it came to mind is uh, one of them said one time, uh, uh, loss of wife. And so I thought, I'm going to be cute. And I, uh, I made a little thing and I gave it to my wife and I said, here, this card is for you. And it said, loss of wife. And, uh, and she, she did not like that. I tell you what, and about four days later, she went through a stack of these things this big. There's a card to me waiting in the morning on the stove that said loss of husband. <laughs> so she got back at me and I got to tell you, I felt bad about that. So it made me realize that I didn't make my, my wife feel very good. But uh, anyway, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here. And um, we'll go ahead and uh, do a uh, 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 get into our sermon now. And uh, before we actually get into talking about anything in particular, I want to tell you, um, and some of you have been here through many of these sermons, some of you haven't, some of you have been with uh, me in Bible classes through the Genesis sermons. And um, the book of Genesis is a book of foundations. It is what establishes the human race. It establishes, it shows us the creation. It shows us the foundation of all things. And not only does it give us a foundation of such as the line leading to the Messiah, which is very clear in how God details it and how he takes these people from outside of that line and inserts them into it throughout these, these obscure little passages. But these passages also show uh, pictures of other things. And today is one of those uh, sermons where there is a picture of something that is so obscure, I've read it probably 50 times and I never understood it and I've seen no commentary ever to reflect what I'm gonna tell you today. And uh, it's just something that uh, uh, I, I am so excited about. And I have a friend that, uh, he's a Jewish guy and we, we uh, go through the Hebrew together at times in case uh, uh, we're missing something and I'll call him, he's up in Atlanta. And uh, I haven't told him what the sermon in particular details, but I said, the only word that I can give for this is almost bizarre. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just that it is a very interesting pattern, which is laid out in something that it, it's totally unexpected. And um, I will give you some examples of this. These patterns are being made in this particular sermon, but there are patterns throughout the Bible. And the Bible is based on the 22 letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. There are 66 uh, chapters in the Bible and three of those chapters each form almost a wheel. Uh, it's like a wheel with spokes and they have patterns that run through them. And then you have the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has patterns in its 66 chapters which reflect the 66 chapters of the Bible. And these are unmistakable and they are found not only in pictures of things but in numbers. They're found in um, uh, words, matching words, matching concepts. Uh, it, it is an astonishing book and it shows the mind of God in a way that is, it, it proves that it's the mind of God. That Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible uh, 3,500 years ago and the, the uh, verses were detailed in the Bible in the year 1560, approximately that by a guy named Robert Stephanus. And the actual verse divisions make patterns as well. The chapters were introduced about 500 years before Stephanus, and I'll talk about this in detail in another sermon coming up, but um, uh, the New Testament writers didn't know that their books would be in the Bible, and they, when they were compiled, they were uh, prayed about by the uh, church of the time, and it was 300, 350 years after the compiling of the, uh, uh, or the writing of these books, and nobody knew the order that they would be in, and yet the books have a special order 
that is reflected throughout the rest of the Bible. And I'm going to give you an example just so you can understand what I'm talking about. The uh, book of Matthew is 28 chapters long. And there are patterns in those 28 chapters which match the first 28 books of the Bible. They're unmistakable and they are numerous in number. And if you've been in my Genesis uh, uh, classes, you would know these things. They, it is the mind of God is revealed in his word. And it's very complicated. And yet it has the simplest, most beautiful message in the world that God loves us. So I'm telling you that now just so that you understand that what we're going to talk about today is not something that was forced into the text. There's a, what we would call isogesis in Greek. Uh, that is taking what you believe in inserting it into the Bible. I believe this and therefore I'm going to make this happen. And then there's what's called exegesis. That means to draw out. What is in the text and what does it mean? What is God intending us, uh, intending for us? And uh, uh, when I did this sermon today, and I want to assure you in advance, and I'm going to mention this again, is that everything that came out of this was exegesis. It came out after I had uh, done this search. Then I went here looking for something and out it comes. So it, it is something that is confirming to me that God had his hand all over the Bible, but in particular today, these uh, short seven verses, which are really, really astonishing to me. Anyway, um, before we get into the actual sermon, I do this every week and uh, it's something that I love to do, uh, is this day in history. Today is 12 May, it's Mother's Day, of course. Uh, but in addition to that, other things happened on 12 May. And one of the things that I was kind of surprised to see is how much uh, the day 12 May uh, relates to the nation of Germany in history. I, I, you know, I haven't mentioned Germany 10 times in all of our this days in histories, and today alone there's probably six things that happened directly with the nation of Germany. Um, you'll see the same type of thing happen with uh, Israel. They have certain days in their history, like the ninth of the month of Av, um, things continuously happen year after year. Bad things happen to the Jewish people on the 9th of Av. And you can go back 2,000 years or more, actually uh, 3,500 years, and you can see these bad things happening. They're recorded in the Bible and extra biblically on the 9th of Av. Well, it appears that 12 May is kind of a day for Germany because I was just astonished at this. But we'll get into that in a minute. We'll start, though, with 1780, where Charleston, South Carolina, fell to the British. And uh, it looked like the young nation was not going to survive about this time. Uh, if you know, uh, Washington was continuously on the retreat. Uh, he would have these little battles and then by God's providence alone, he would get away. The British would fail to do something that would have wiped him out. And you'll see fog moving in at certain times during his battles and saving the day. And uh, anyway, but at this point in our nation's history, it looked like things weren't going well. Uh, but we do know that we prevailed in the end. But 1780, Charleston, South Carolina fell. 1831, Edward Smith. Now you think this is 1831 and the nation was established, you know, in the 1780s, basically, 1770s, 1780s. Um, it was, he was the first person indicted in a bank robbery in the United States. So 40 some years it took for that. Now we have thousands of them a day, literally. But it shows you the, the kind of peaceful nature of the people because yes, there were banks and there, were, uh, uh, there was commerce and uh, there were no indictments of bank robberies until this time, which is, it, it just kind of strikes me as odd. Uh, in 1847, uh, the site that I went to said that William Clayton invented the odometer on this day. Well, that's not actually correct because um, I, I uh, did some more studies and I knew something from before anyway. Uh, the odometer as we know it, the, the concept of tracking miles actually came from a British uh, uh, invention which tracked miles by sea. And then of course we had um, our great inventor, mind and uh, diplomat uh, Benjamin Franklin actually invented a rudimentary odometer for the US Postal Service because he was our U first US Postmaster. And uh, so he was a genius of all sorts. But uh, this guy, William Clayton, invented an odometer, which he called the rotometer. And he actually put it on wagons with uh, cows and horses being drawn. Uh, he was a Mormon. But anyway, he marked the miles by this thing. And this goes back to uh, 1847. And uh, if you've ever seen a, or if you want to see a picture of it, I'll post it with this sermon today. Um, it's this big, massive thing, and it's all handmade. It's got gears and worm gears and sprocket gears and all kinds of stuff. And I mean, it's, it's amazing. This guy just put this thing together and clicks off the miles. So uh, kind of a fun little thing. Uh, 1888, a guy named Charles Sherrill of the Yale track team became, here's another one. It, this just gets me to no end. It, it, does anybody remember the Berghoff blast off? 
Remember that? Uh, it, during the Olympics, several Olympics ago, a guy uh, was in one of these swimming meets. And it was, you know, you dive off and you start swimming. Well, he did what he invented, what's called the Berghoff Blastoff. He went underwater like a porpoise and he was way out in front of everybody else. And then he came up with his first breath of air and joined into that particular stroke. And now that's a standard. People do this all the time. But he was the first to do it and they didn't even know if it was legal. But he hadn't come up for air and he started and he, he just blew the people away. So anyway, um, this guy, Charles Sherrill, did kind of the same thing. And it astonishes me that it's the year 1888 he became the first runner to use the crouching start for a track race. And you think it took, you know, they had since the Olympiads, the Greek times, people uh, uh, were racing and this is the first guy ever to do the crouch start and now everybody does it. So it's just one of those things that there's this sudden leap and then it becomes the standard. And I, that kind of stuff just amazes me how something so simple, so rudimentary just escapes the whole human race for thousands and thousands of years, fun stuff. Um, 1932, this is a very sad one. The infant body of Charles and Anna Lindbergh, their son was found a few miles from the Lindbergh home near Hopewell, New Jersey. And of course this made the national news. It was all over the uh, nation at the time. And uh, it was kind of like the Jean Benet Ramsey thing that happened in uh, our lifetime. Uh, you know, the media fixates on certain things and they disregard other things. I mean, we've got a calamity going on in our uh, government right now that's being ignored by most of the media. And, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the way it is. But uh, this was a national thing. And uh, does anybody remember who was caught and convicted and executed for this crime? Bruno Hauptmann. Bruno Hauptmann. I knew my dad was going to get that. He, is, he, he remembers people. Uh, 1940, on this day, we start in with Germany now. The Nazi conquest of France began when Germany crossed the Meuse River, okay? So uh, France eventually fell to the Germans and they became, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, oh, I forgot the term anyway. They were under their, they were occupied by Germany. And um, that went on for a while. And of course, uh, things started to degrade to degrade eventually for Germany. And uh, in 1942, two years later to the day, the Soviet army launched its first major offensive of World War II and took Kharkov in the eastern Ukraine from the German army. So Germany had this great uh, beginning of their, uh, their conquest of France. And two years later, the Eastern Front is not going well. And the Russians are moving in and starting to uh, inflict damage on them and putting them on the, uh, the defensive and into a retreat mode. And uh, then in 1943, on this same day, the Axis forces in North Africa, which was predominantly the Germans, along with Italy, uh, they uh, surrendered. So that was 150,000 of the Axis forces just raised their hands and said, we're done. And uh, that happened on this day, 12 May, 1943. So you see, Germany is really involved in a lot of things on 12 May. Well, of course, 1949, something else happens. The uh, Soviet Union announced an end to the Berlin blockade. And uh, some of you may not know what the Berlin blockade is, but uh, uh, Germany after the war was divided into East and West Germany. Of course, you had East Germany belonged to the Russians and West Germany was to the, uh, uh, the free side. And um, Berlin was the capital of Germany and it was considered a free city. So it was in Eastern Germany and there was a road that went up to it and they knew that if they went in and attacked it and tried to take over Berlin, that that would have caused the world to come against them. So instead, they just closed the road. And they said, nobody comes in and nobody comes out and we're not going to feed you. And they thought that they had victory by default in uh, Berlin because of this. And then, of course, came what was called the Berlin Airlift. And the Berlin Airlift was a massive undertaking, especially right after a war, you know, a world war. The uh, Allies came together. And they started flying into Berlin, flying over the road and landing in the uh, airway in uh, Berlin. And it became known as what's called the three minute beat. Every three minutes, day in, day out, 24 hours a day, planes flew in with supplies to uh, keep the people of uh, West Berlin alive. And eventually the Soviets conceded. And we couldn't have gone on forever with this, but they blinked just as they did with the uh, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, the funny thing is that one C-5 aircraft, which I've flown on around the world in the Air Force nowadays, they're massive, could have done the work of almost all of those planes, one aircraft. But at the time they had 
these cargo airplanes, these little things flying in every three minutes. There were actually some catastrophes, a uh, Russian uh, fighter and a uh, cargo airplane uh, collided. That was the first accident and there were others, but for the most part, it was an astonishing feat of people getting together and making things happen that nobody thought could happen. And uh, so uh, Berlin was kept from the communist forces because of that. 1965, West Germany again and Israel established diplomatic relations. 20 years after six million of their people had been exterminated, they're putting out their hand and they're shaking hands with their enemies. So what a testament to uh, the ability to pe of people to overcome past differences, Israel and West Germany. And then, uh, oh, this one just gets me. Talk about political correctness in our modern day. This is it right here. NOAA, the National Oceanic uh, Atmospheric Administration, announced that they would no longer exclusively name hurricanes after women. You know, of course, it gets more bizarre every year. You can't name a ship a woman or somebody gets upset. You can't have a sports team called after an Indian tribe anymore. Or people get upset. It, it, it's gone insane. So we no longer have only hurricanes. We now have hissicanes as well. Now, there you go. That was 1978. And then to me, the most appalling. This is the most appalling. And if you don't know my politics, then you will when I get done saying this. Uh, in 2003, what has now become the standard, this is not an exception, this became the standard of the party that I do not belong to. In Texas, 59 Democrat, le 59 Democrat lawmakers went into hiding over a dispute with Republicans over a congressional redistricting plan. Now, any time that they are not in the majority and they don't like what's going on, they simply pack their bags and they leave. And they continue to get their paychecks for doing nothing. And this is a democracy. Actually, it's a federal republic, but uh, uh, this is a, uh, a law, uh, a nation where we elect our leaders to do a job. And if they're not in the majority, then they are still to be there and do their job. And it has become the status quo of people to just run with their tails between their legs. And it does, it serves nothing because in the end, the law will go into effect. And it just shows the, the perverse nature of politics in our world today. It's a very sad thing. But anyway, enough of uh, that. We're getting into now um, uh, Genesis 30. We're going to finish Genesis 30 today. And I, I just am amazed. I want you, as I'm reading this, to think. Last week we talked about Jacob. He was making an agreement. And we're, I'm going to read you last week's verses in a couple minutes. But um, he was making an agreement with Laban to build his flocks. And I told you at the time that that was picturing the building of the church during the church age. Now listen to the verses today and see if you can mentally grasp any of this and relate it to the church age before I explain it to you because it is astonishing. It, it is just wonderful stuff. Here we go. Uh, this is uh, chapter 30, verses 37 through 43. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled he set before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs where the flocks came to him, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived, brought forth, uh, uh, I'm sorry, before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler, feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Last week we saw the separation of those specially marked flocks from the other sol solid colored animals of Laban's. We saw then that this was a picture of the Jewish people who bore the outward mark of circumcision but had not been sealed by the Holy Spirit, the inward mark of, of circumcision. They are a specially marked group of people but they are not a part of what God will do for one particular portion in human history. This is the dispensation of grace. This is the church age. And that's what's going to be pictured here as it started last week and will be fulfilled or completed this week. Remember, the church started with Jewish people and there have always been Jewish people in the church. And that's important to remember. It's not exclusively Gentile, it's predominantly Gentile. 
They are those at the beginning of the church who had both the external mark of circumcision and the internal mark of circumcision, the Holy Spirit. The others with the external mark only were separated from the uh, Jacob's flocks. Laban's flocks were separated by a three-day journey. And that was explained at the time from as being the time from the dispersion of Israel to its reestablishment, which is a 2,000-year period. A three-day journey implies that you start on one day, you travel the next day, and you arrive on the third day. During this 2,000-year period, or this three-day journey, God is building a special flock of people known as the church. He has taken his flock from the people of the world, which are represented by Laban's flocks. However, they are specially raised up by him, and they've been tended to and cared for by him as he has strengthened his church. In the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the chief shepherd. He's referred to as the good shepherd and the great shepherd. All of these imply that he is one who tends to his flocks, just as Jacob is tending to the flocks here. So as we're going through this today, keep thinking of Jacob's flocks and the imagery. The imagery that we're given here is that Jacob is tending to his own flocks. At times, Jesus removes those who fail to meet his standards, and he returns them to the other flocks so that they don't spoil the sheep of his fold. Remember, during this time, the original specially marked flock is separated and kept by Laban in his fold. They remain a flock, and God will someday return them to his fold. But for now, his eyes and his attention are on this called out and tenderly cared for group of people. This is the Lord's beloved church for whom he gave his life and which even now he is building up. Someday, they're going to be taken out with him to his eternal promised land. And this marvelous working of God is pictured in the seven verses that we're going to look at today. Our text verse for today comes from 2 Corinthians, it's chapter six. And I want you to note, as I'm going through these verses today, again and again and again, the book of 2 Corinthians is going to come up. It's gonna come up and I did not plan it this way. It's just simply the way that it worked out. Here's our text verse. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Jacob walked among his flock and he tended to them. He kept them separated, the stronger from the weak. He was a shepherd and a caretaker of them. And the book of Revelation says that Jesus does exactly the same thing for us right now during the church age. It says that he walks among the lampstands, representing the churches. There are seven churches mentioned and there's a lampstand. Each one of them represents a church. And he removes those lampstands from the churches which fail to meet his standards. There's nothing unfair or arbitrary about how God deals with his people. He keeps the good ones and he rejects the bad ones. It is his church and he is building it to be the best that it can be, just as Jacob was building the best possible flock for himself. So let's work, all of us here, to be the best of the best of Jesus' flock. And may God speak to us through his word today. And may his glorious name ever be praised. All right, now before we get into today's verses, I wanna go ahead and I wanna read you the agreement from last week that J Jacob made with Laban. And this is going to show us why Jacob is doing the things that he's doing today, okay? This is last week's sermon text. So he said, I, what shall I give you? This is Laban speaking now to Jacob. And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all of your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the speckled and spotted among the goats. And these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled or spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, everyone that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs. And he gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Our first thought today, a special flock. Verse 37, now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods. The set of verses today 
is curious. There's a lot of speculation as to the ability of Jacob's efforts here to actually produce the results that the story claims. There's also the claim that if what he does actually works, then he's being deceitful in what he's doing. Now, just so you know, the name Jacob means deceiver, so that's more than possible. But whether he was actually being deceitful or not, what he ultimately did was sanctioned by God, as we're going to see in the next chapter. God purposed to bless him, and indeed, he will be blessed. The account is occurring 14 years after his arrival in Mesopotamia, just after he had his vision of the ladder from heaven. And that's important to remember. I'll get back to that in a minute. The term for green poplar here is the word livne lach. Livne is the white poplar. And the term lach implies that it is fresh or it's green. Green then means the state of the poplar, not its type or its color. He's using fresh poplar because it was, if it wasn't fresh, then the bark wouldn't peel off. The next tree is translated as the almond. That comes from the word lutz. Some believe it's a filbert tree, but nobody is completely sure which it is, and people will argue over it. The third tree is called the chestnut, but it's probably, as other translations state, the plane tree. The word is armon, and it means to be stripped bare, as in a naked person. The plane tree gets its name because the outer bark will peel off all by itself as it's growing throughout the year. It'll just peel off, and it'll be smooth and bare in places. This happens year by year. Jacob takes these fresh branches and cuts them in strips to show the contrasting colors. Now, one thing that's important is it doesn't just simply say that Jacob took rods and peeled off the, uh, the uh, bark and put them in the watering troughs. It names the rods. And anytime you see a name of a person or a place or a thing, or anytime you see a number, a specific number, rather than a general number, God is trying to tell us something very specific. So we're going to go into detail into this and to try to discern why these particular names are used. Some people, though, he's taking these and he's putting strips in the rod. Some people think that he might have, rather than stripping the rods, have put a spiral line along the rod, stripping it this way, so that they would be partly white and partly colored when you looked at them, okay? Resembling the model color of the animals, all right? One commentator says that the Hebrew indicates that he didn't cut stripes or spirals, but instead he cut patches into them. And so that would have the same visual effect as the spirals and it would show model colors. Or you know what I was thinking about is that it could be that he did all three because there are three types of animals designated, streaked, speckled, and spotted. And because of that, it may be that the Hebrew, because it can mean any of those three things, actually means all three of those three things. What is being pictured here, I got to tell you what is most interesting. What we need to do is to look at the roots of the words used to describe these trees. The first is the poplar tree. The Hebrew word is livne, but it is derived directly from the word lavan, which is the name of Jacob's father-in-law, Laban. Okay, This guy Laban is mentioned again and again and again for many chapters of the Bible. And he is one of the most enigmatic and curious figures that you will run across in all of the Genesis sermons. And I gotta tell you what, he will show up, his name will show up about four times in today's sermon alone. It's God is trying to tell us something specific. This word Laban or Lavan means white or brick. A brick when it is fired will turn white. And that's the idea that one gets from this type of wood. Laban is a picture of the people of the world. The next tree, which is translated as almond, as I said, is the word lutz. This word actually means crooked or twisted. And if you've ever seen an almond tree or a filbert tree, they have kind of crooked, twisted looking branches. It comes from the verb though, lutz, which means to turn aside in a negative way, such as turning aside from wisdom. A couple examples of this, of the uh, verb and of the adjective are given in the book of Proverbs. And I want to read them to you so you get an idea of what this word means. The first one is from Proverbs chapter three. It says, for the perverse person, the word perverse is this word lutz, is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. All right, then in the next chapter, chapter four, it says this, my son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, do not let them depart from your eyes. Okay, that's the word lutz again, depart. Keep them in the midst of your heart. The third tree here is the chestnut, which I said comes from armon, to be naked. But that root word is the word aram, which means to be crafty or to be prudent. The word is used this way in Proverbs chapter 15. A fool despises his father's instruction, 
but he who receives correction is prudent. Finally, as an interesting tidbit, the word white in this verse, when he stripped these rods, all three of them, is the word Lavan. It's once again the same as the name of Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, and it's being used as an adjective in this case. The idea is that the branches are being stripped bare, as if naked, to affect their purposes. So why are these type of branches being mentioned and what is their significance? I got to tell you, and I've said this once and I'll say it again, I didn't plan this and I was completely surprised when the same pattern kept coming up time and time again. And as a confirmation of it, the same book of the New Testament came up again and again too. This is far more than coincidence. The flock that is being built here, as we discovered last week and we'll continue to see this week, is a picture of the church being built up by Jesus. The branches are all picturing, believe it or not, the writings of Paul, who was the apostle to the Gentiles. This is, after researching these words and looking to the New Testament for a fulfillment, 100% completely sure. The first verse, which marks out a parallel, is what Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians, once again, 2 Corinthians. Listen to what he says, and then I'm going to remind you of something I said a minute ago. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast, Paul says. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, he's speaking about himself, but in uh, the third person, who 14 years ago, whether in the body or not, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which was not lawful for a man to utter. The picture of Jacob's work here that we're looking at in these verses is occurring 14 years after his vision of the ladder reaching up to heaven, his heavenly vision. And this is the same pattern that Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians 14 years after he had his vision. There was a time when they believed when he was, I think, in Ephesus and he was stoned. And I don't mean on marijuana. He was stoned by stones and they took him outside of the city and they thought he was dead and they left him there. And they believed that that's when he had this vision. Okay, but you see the pattern here. And God specifically mentions the year 14 or the number 14 in both instances. And so we want to make sure that we understand that we are being given a parallel between what happened with Jacob and what is happening with Paul. The first of the branches is the poplar. It's translated, as I said, from a word which means fired clay. Paul uses the terminology of fired clay or earthen vessels to indicate believers when they become filled with the Holy Spirit, including himself. Here's what he says, once again, from the book of 2 Corinthians. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, or if you read the NIV, it says jars of clay, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So we see the parallel here between Laban, the fired brick, the white, and the jars of clay here. The second of the branches is the almond, translated from a word which means crooked. Now Paul, before his conversion, was included in Peter's acts to the people of Israel in Acts chapter 2. Here's what Peter said to the people of Israel, which included Paul. And with many other words, he, Peter, bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. However, after his conversion, Paul uses the same terminology to describe the people that he had left and whom he now warned against. And it's from the same book, the book of 2 Corinthians. Do all things, it says, without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. The third of the branches is the chestnut, translated from a word, as I said, whose root indicates being crafty or prudent. Paul explains how he wooed the Corinthians to himself and to the gospel message, and he does it in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says there, but be that as it may, I did not burden you myself. Nevertheless, crafty person that I am, or crafty fellow that I am, I took you in by deceit. Not only does he say he was crafty, but he says he took them in by deceit, making a pun on the name of Jacob, which means deceiver. Paul's messages, 
His epistles are what are being pictured in these rods which are building up Jacob's flock. It is his letters which establish church doctrine because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. All of these comparisons came out of the book of 2 Corinthians and this was not planned by me at all. It just came up that way. God is telling us again and again, he's tying the account of Jacob's rods directly to Paul who is the author of the doctrine for the church and directly to the book of 2 Corinthians. These branches, despite their surface appearance, had to be stripped. They had to be made bare, as if naked in order to have their intended effect. Again, to confirm that this is speaking about Paul in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul says this concerning his work in the book of 2 Corinthians. Now, as I'm reading this, think of the flocks. Think of Jacob separating the flocks and think of Paul's mindset here. He says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. So he's talking about stripes in an animal, for example, in the flocks. Three times I was beaten with rods. He uses the term rods, which is what Jacob is using in his uh, troughs. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, referring back to the Hebrew word aram, besides the other things which come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation. Paul was beaten with rods, as I said, it's the same word that's used to describe the branches that were used by Jacob. He was also left in the cold and the nakedness. It was as if he was stripped bare for the sake of the flock. Terminology that is using himself, which is being prefigured in these verses. So here we have a picture of Paul's testimony being used by Jesus, which is pictured by Jacob's rods to bring out a special flock from the world, which is pictured by Laban's flocks. This is exactly what we're seeing here. Even Jacob's words coming up in the next chapter of Genesis, chapter 31, reflect what Paul said about his own trials that we just read. Listen to Jacob's words. Like I said, this is coming up in the next chapter and see how they resemble what Paul just said about working for the flocks, okay? These 20 years, Jacob says, I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young. And I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day drought consumed me. Think of what Paul said. And the frost by night and sleep departed from my eyes. Exactly what Paul was saying. Jacob has his concern for the flock and Paul has his concern for Jesus' flock. The parallels are being made right here again and again. Once again, I didn't plan these things. They all just happened to come out of the book of 2 Corinthians. Verse 38, and the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters and the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. After peeling the rods, he places them in the watering troughs, the gutters. There the water would be channeled out of the spring and into these long gutter-shaped troughs or they'd be carried from a well and they'd be dumped into long hollowed out stones so the flocks could, you know, more than one animal could drink at one time. The colors of the branches are going to vary from white to green to red depending on the type and where he strips them and how old they are when he does that. The general idea here is that when the flocks were in heat, Whatever impression is on their mind would be transferred to the body of the fetus when she bred. Now, a couple of options come to mind with this. The first is either that's nuts and what he's doing has absolutely no bearing on the color or the uh, texture of the offspring, but rather God intervened and blessed him with the various colored offspring apart from what he did. Okay, a second option is that this method somehow began to affect the genetic makeup of the babies, all right, which I don't think is very probable. Or third, and what is probably most likely, is that the modeling of the animals is found in a recessive gene. The recessive genes make it possible for goats to have spots which can be transmitted, though they don't appear to the eyes, but the genes are still there. So what is happening? Even though we don't know which of the goats have this gene, the goats do. And they're prompted, when prompted to mate in front of these branches, their inclination is to mate with the goats that have this gene. This seems like a plausible answer, and it's also 
something that fits with the mating habits which are found all throughout nature. We see this all the time. If you don't believe this, just turn on PBS and watch nature sometime and you will see the incredible wisdom of animals in their mating cycles. Animals make their selections based on the wisdom that God has endowed in them. We have butterflies that fly thousands and thousands of miles, starting up in Canada and they go all the way down to one single valley in Mexico. And they're not a first generation, they're not the second generation, they're the third generation of butterfly. They've never been where their parents and their grandparents have never been. And yet they know exactly where to go because God has endowed them with this wisdom to do this year after year after year. And this is the giant monarch butterflies, but we see this all through nature. To understand the spiritual side of this verse, we see that the flocks are coming to the water where the rods are. This picture is the people of the world, Laban's flocks, the people of the world, coming to spirituality. Maybe they're picking up their Bible to read. These are the flocks who see the rods in the water. The water is the word and the rods are Paul's letters to the church. It tells us the Gentile world about Jesus. Those who receive this message are going to be converted and become a part of Jesus' flock. They will receive the mark which distinguishes them from the rest of the flock. And we know that from Paul's writings, it's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It's given by God. Just so you know, this isn't meant, and I want you to understand this. This does not mean that the rest of the Bible is not just as important, okay? I'm not trying to make that error in your head, but it is made clear in the Bible that Paul's words are intended for the church during this dispensation. This is what's being pictured by Jacob while he is outside of the promised land, building up flocks from the Gentile world. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. It says that explicitly, I think four, maybe five times in the New Testament. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. That's said explicitly, all right? Paul is specifically chosen by Jesus for this dispensation. And we see that recorded in Acts chapter nine. Paul uh, was blinded on the road to Damascus. He goes up to, uh, he's taken up to Damascus. Uh, Jesus appears to a guy named Ananias in a vision and he tells this guy, Ananias, I want you to go and heal this guy who's blind. And Ananias says, I'm not going there. This guy is, you know, he's been persecuting the church. And here's the Lord's answer to Ananias. He says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. The fact is that all scripture, all of the Bible is God breathed and it is useful for doctrine, it's useful for reproof, but not all scripture is applicable in the same way at the same time. James and Peter are in the New Testament. You got the book of James and you got one and two Peter. They are not written to the Gentiles in the church. Does anybody know who he wrote, they wrote their letters to? They wrote them to the Jews. James begins with to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. That's not Gentiles. Peter wrote to the pilgrims of the dispersion, meaning the Jews who were dispersed around the world. That is who they are directed to. That doesn't mean that those letters are not meant for us, but that they hold a different application than Paul's letters do. This is what we're learning from this short and seemingly obscure passage about rods in water. If the church misses the significance of what Paul writes, their doctrines become convoluted. And I'm gonna mention this again later so you understand what I'm talking about. As long as we keep our theological boxes straight, the plan that God is accomplishing in the church makes much more sense and our relationship with him will be much more properly aligned. All right, verse 39. So the flocks conceived before the rods. The rods and the flocks brought forth, streaked, speckled, and spotted. Whatever was actually going on in the mind of these goats, they in fact did have streaked, speckled, and spotted offspring instead of the predominantly solid colored ones which would have then belonged to Laban. One thing is for sure, this actually happened because God's word records that it did. And ultimately, God is the one who directed it, even if human means were employed. This then is a picture of the continuation and the growth of the church. The rods are in the water, they are Paul's words to the church and the water is the word. The flocks are bringing forth young who are marked with this special designation of the church, the mark of the Holy Spirit. They are a separate people with a separate purpose in God's unfolding plans. And that brings us to our second and final thought today, come out and be separate. Now, when I chose the text verse for this sermon today, like I said, I didn't realize that it was from two Corinthians until I actually got into the sermon. 
just as all of the verses that Paul uses in today's sermon come from 2 Corinthians. And I didn't plan that. A portion of our text verse for today, though, says this. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This is the idea that came to my mind, this particular verse, when I started evaluating the next verses that we're going to look at. And I didn't even realize, once again, I wasn't thinking, well, that's in 2 Corinthians. I just happened to think, you know, I want to use this particular set of uh, words for this particular set of verses. And sure enough, there it is. And we're going to see this picture now. Verse 40. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streak and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them in with Laban's flock. There's real wisdom in what Jacob is doing now. After the first season, he's begun to get his own streaked animals. So he puts them in front of the solid colored ones so that when they feed, the streaked ones are always going to be in their sight. Now he can rely less on the branches and more on the actual animals. But he used both techniques in order to continuously have it on the minds of the animals when they are getting ready to mate. When they're eating, when they're drinking, anytime it's on their mind. In the same way, and here's the picture we should get from this, we should always be meditating on God's word at all times. Even when we're eating, even when we're drinking, or even when we're lazily laying around in a field looking at other sheep, we should be thinking about God's word. Eventually, Jacob has enough to make his own flock, which he now separates from Laban's. By doing this, they're going to be less inclined to mate with the solid colored animals and possibly increase Laban's flocks. He's keeping his flock uniform and separate while still influencing other flocks. The spiritual picture here, and I'm certain of this, is that the rest of the world is to look to us, the flock of Jesus, just as Laban's flocks were set off to look at the specially marked flocks of Jacob, not the other way around. We are to be the standard by which the world sets its aspirations. The church is to be the ideal and the goal. Jesus has set us apart for a reason. And because of this, for us to get intermingled with the world can only cause us to become more like them, not the opposite. And I'm not talking about us going out into the world and mingling with people. I'm talking about within a church body. That's what I'm talking about. This is why I'm so personally opposed to these new seeker-friendly churches which are popping up all over the world. In the end, what happens? It only diminishes the distinction of who we are to be. When we lower our standards of separation within the church body, the flock is what suffers. And this is exactly what we're seeing in today's verses. So please keep that in mind. Verse 41, And it came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. Now Jacob adds in a third tactic to increase his wealth. The sheep give birth twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. But there's also a divide between those born in the first part of the season and the later part of the season. You have the first part, they're born closer to the winter and they're gonna be hardier because they're enduring the colder weathers. Those that are born in the latter part of this uh, birthing cycle will be born during the warmer climates and so they're gonna be weaker. Those born in the earlier time are going to be the hardier of the flock. And as I said, the ones born a little later are the weaker of the flock. The stronger, healthier ones got his attention. And the ones that were weaker got put right back in Laban's flock. And this again takes us directly to, yes, to Corinthians. Paul writes this concerning our relationships. Okay, He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. As I said, this is not specifically speaking about us going out into the world, although it does imply that when we get married and things like that, we should be yoked with the believer as well. It's specifically speaking in the context of the church. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? You sit in a church where somebody is not a converted Christian and they're in a leadership position. They've got moral issues, they've got these other things. What is that going to do to the rest of the flock? It's going to degrade it. And we've got churches all over the world that do this. They don't care diddly about who is in their church. Anybody can come into any church and they can be a member. I'm sorry, not a member. They can come in and they can sit and they can listen to the, to the word. But we need to be careful that the people that we allow as members have 
professed faith in Jesus Christ and they've put away the old sins. And the people that are in the leadership positions are not to be from the flock of Laban. They're to be from the flock of Jacob. And that's what we're getting here. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what, has, what part has a believer with an unbeliever? The stronger of the flocks are set apart by Jacob, and Jesus sets us apart as well. Jacob did not allow his flocks to intermingle with the flocks of Laban. And Jesus sets the exact same prohibition for us through Paul's hand. I can't stress the amazing symmetry of what we're seeing in this short passage about Jacob putting rods in a watering trough. As I was researching this sermon, I was completely, completely amazed at what lay before me. This passage here is something, like I said, I've read it many, many times, and I never understood the significance until I started preparing for this sermon and seeing how God keeps bringing it right back to the book of 2 Corinthians. Because of the separation, Laban's flock continued to spiral downward, while Jacob's flock continued to breed multicolored offspring. This is seen in the next verse, verse 42. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. The flocks have all come from the same place. They all came from the original flock of Laban's sheep. However, they've become separate and distinct over time. The weaker ones are being kept separate from the stronger. The weaker ones are kept in Laban's flocks, and the stronger ones are kept in Jacob's flocks. Looking at this from a spiritual perspective, Paul writes in both in 2 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13 the contrast between what is weak and what is strong. And I want to read you both of those passages. They're not long, but I want you to see how this is fulfilled in the church. And as I'm reading this, once again, keep thinking of the flocks, what Jacob is doing, and see how it's reflected in what Paul says in his own words. He says, and he said to me, this is from 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Now speaking to the flock, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Then he goes on in 2 Corinthians 13, and he says, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Do you not know, test yourselves. Do you not know your, that you yourselves are, that Christ Jesus is in you unless you are disqualified? Keep thinking of these flocks. This one is disqualified. This one is staying. This one is just... But I trust that you will know that you are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. Our strength in the expansion of the church is wholly dependent on the strength of Christ. Jacob separated what was weak from what was strong, and the strong grew and flourished. Likewise, it is only through an understanding of our weakness that the strength of God through Christ is revealed. Paul asks us to examine ourselves and see if we truly are in the faith. If so, then we are a member of Jesus' flock. And if not, then we will be separated from that flock, just as Paul states here. Keep thinking of the flocks and the mating that's going on and what Paul is telling us. Verse 43, last verse of the day. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Through the attentive care of the shepherd, his flock has grown so big that he is able to sell or trade parts of his own flock for other wealth, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. These are the signs of the wealth at the time of Jacob's life just as a large company with a lot of employees and expensive cars would be today. In the same way, Jesus has become exceedingly prosperous, having begotten many sheep for his flock. Now, so this is the last verse of the passage today. I thought, I want to tie this in with the New Testament verse. And one, mind came, one verse came to mind immediately. It came that fast, but I didn't know where the verse was. And so I went to look for it. And when I put it in and pulled it out of the computer, Yes, once again, it's from the book of 2 Corinthians. Here's what it says. 
and see how this doesn't mirror perfectly what I just read about Jesus and our person Jacob back with his flocks. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jacob left Canaan and he became poor, not accepting anything as wages except his brides and the fruit of his flock. Jesus gave up his glorious heavenly home to come and dwell among us. He procured his bride. Through the fulfilling of the law, which is Leah, he established a church without spot or wrinkle, pictured by Rachel. By his work, which is administered through the hand of Paul, he obtains the fruit of his flock, which is a called out group of Gentiles from the people of the world. Though he was rich with heaven's glories, he became poor. And now with him, we might also become rich and become a part of his eternal plan. So the question is now, why is this story important? And I alluded to this earlier. Why Paul's letters? And I want to explain in detail. It'll take about two minutes for me to explain this to you. We have the Bible. And it's all of these books, and the different books are written at different times in human history to different people about different things. And I want to give you an example, and a lot of people freak out the first time they hear this until they think it through. The four gospel accounts are written under the law. They're not written to the church at all. They are written about Jesus fulfilling the law on our behalf. Not one word of what Jesus said until the night that he was crucified when he established a new covenant was the church even considered. It is all Old Testament theology, even though it's written in the New Testament. And then you come to the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is divided between the first 12 chapters, which point to the work of Peter, and then from 13 to 28, which point to the work of Paul. And it's showing the transition from Jew to Gentile. And then, of course, the book of Acts starts in Jerusalem, and it ends in Rome, Jew to Gentile. And the first book of Paul that Paul writes is the book of Romans. And he writes these 13 epistles, which are written to the church, and every one of them is to a Gentile people. Romans, Galatians, Colossians, Ephesians, they're all sons of Japheth, the second son of Noah. They're not sons of Shem, who is the Jewish people, okay? So this is what God is doing. He's giving us these words for a specific reason. I'll give you one more example. So that maybe you've been in one of these churches in the past and you wonder why it doesn't feel right. If you're in a church and they claim an Acts 2 experience, they say, we're gonna have fire come down from heaven and we're all gonna speak in these crazy tongues and we're gonna do these nutty things. And you think there's something wrong with what's going on in this church. That's because it is. Acts 2 was spoken by Peter to the people of Israel. It was not spoken to the people, the Gentile people. The Samaritans didn't show up until Acts chapter eight. The Gentiles didn't show up until Acts chapter 10. Acts 2 is something that happened one time in human history for a specific reason for a specific group of people. And that's why we need to keep our theological boxes straight. And if we start diverting from the letters of Paul, and we're being told that in this picture right here today, if we divert from that, the flock is weakened, the flock is harmed, and the flock moves away from what Jesus expects for us as Christians in a world full of wickedness. That's why we need to make sure that when we perceive the Bible, we perceive who is being written to, why is this being written, and how does this pertain to me? Everything in the Bible pertains to every single one of you, but differently, okay? Keep that in mind. That's the importance of what we're learning from this little lesson today. Now, in case you have never made a commitment to the Lord Jesus, and I don't know if everybody here has ever called on Jesus and said, I need this, because without it, you are not going to heaven, whether you like it or not. You will not enter heaven's gates without being sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And there's only one way for this to happen. It's to reject all other religion in the world, all of man's devices, and to say, I want what Jesus offers. He's the one that fulfilled the law on our behalf. He's the one that gave his life up on a cross. And I gotta tell you what, if there's any other way to get to heaven apart from Jesus, then God made the biggest cosmic blunder in the universe by crucifying his own son. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. So he fulfilled that law. He lived that perfect life that you and I cannot live, and then he gave it up as a substitute for every bad thing that you have ever done. And he says, if you will put your trust in me, I will move you from Adam, from Laban's flocks, to me, to Jacob's flocks, and you will be a part of this specially marked flock for all eternity. And it's by a simple act of faith, I want Jesus. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's what he asks you to do. And it's hard, it's hard to put away your own self. But once you do that, it is done. 
And God is pleased to call you his son or his daughter. So if you've never made that commitment in your heart, you don't know when your last day is. You don't know when it's coming. Do it today. All right? Our closing verse for today comes directly from 2 Corinthians. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The gift of the sealing of the Holy Spirit. The gift of his beautiful word, which tells us all of these things about God's great love for the human person. All the things we've done wrong, and he still will call out to us and say, come to me. Next week is Genesis 31, verses 1 through 13. It's called Return to the Land of Your Fathers. Jacob's been waiting a long time. 20 years after leaving his home, he's going to be returning home. And we're going to see that next week. I'll tell you before we give our, our poem of the week that the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. And he has a good plan and a purpose for you. So call on him and let him do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay, today's poem is based on the uh, verses that we just looked at. We, I do this every single week and we're getting closer to a full poem of the book of Genesis, but uh, this is called Jacob's Flock, Jesus Church. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and the chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them from the bottom to the toppler and exposed the white which was in the rods of these. And the rods which he had peeled link by link, he set before the flo flocks and gutters to deceive in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that when they came, they should conceive. So the flocks conceived before the rods, and yes, they begotted, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs by their stock and made the flocks face towards the streaked and all the brown of Laban's flock. But he put his own flocks alone as their genes he tweaked. He did not put them with Laban's flock. He kept them apart, maintaining the purity of his stock. And it came to pass in this plan so wise, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, who would have believed, that they might conceive among the rods, and that his flock would increase against all odds. But when the flocks were feeble, then no longer would he put them in the gutters. So the feebler were Laban's, and Jacob had the stronger. The story is before us, and wisdom it utters. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants too, and camels and donkeys. It's not preposterous. It really happened because God blessed his work. It's true. And as we see, this story pictures the church, those who are the flock of the Lord Jesus. Throughout the world, his spirit does search, and by his grace, he does transform us. Through the writings of Paul, his apostle to the Gentile, a flock is being ready day by day, mile by mile. The message is bringing about that wondrous change in us and molding us into a special people to our Lord Jesus. And so while he transforms us, let us remember to give him praise and to live our lives in holiness and honor to him all our days. Great, glorious, and splendid God above, thank you for your indescribable gift of love. He is our precious Lord whom you gave to us. And so let us ever proclaim the name of Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the absolute certainty of eternal life because of what you've done through Jesus. Thank you for that. I know that's something that not one of us could ever even cl come close to repaying, but by a simple act of faith, we can receive it and we can spend all eternity praising you for it. What a great, gracious, kind and merciful God you are. How beautiful it is to stand in your presence and to know you and to be able to search out your word and to see these beautiful pictures. Thank you, God. And thank you once again for our mothers on this Mother's Day. Thank you that they uh, have raised us in uh, whatever fashion each one of us was raised, uh, remembering only the good times and never the bad times where we got our own stripes. Thank you, Lord, for our mothers. We just love you. We praise you. All glory, all majesty, all hail the name of Jesus. Amen.